Now there's two main kinds of fiber. One is soluble fiber that dissolves in water. And there's insoluble fibers that do not dissolve in water. And then there's something else they're calling a third kind of fiber now. It's called resistant starch. And we find this especially in beans. And uh, so beans are great for us, great for diabetics, great for all of us. Now you want your colon to be happy, right? You want a happy gut that's healthy. We don't want uh, colon cancer or all those kind of things that can happen to the colon. And if you eat the right foods with lots of soluble and insoluble fiber and resistant starch, it feeds your good gut bacteria and encourages the right kind of bacteria in your gut. Now, you've probably heard of probiotics where you're putting the right kind of bacteria in, but we're not going to talk about that tonight. We're going to talk about prebiotics, foods that encourage good bacteria growth. And by the way, um, you may not have known this, I didn't, it was quite interesting for me to find this out, but most of your stool is actually bacteria. Uh, I thought that was very interesting. We never think of it that way, but there's trillions and trillions and trillions of bacteria in the colon and in your stool. And so when you have a bulky stool, uh, most of that is actually bacteria that you, you have. Okay, now the, when we feed this good bacteria, the kind that we want in our colon, it produces something called butyrate from these fibers that it breaks down and it gives us a healthy colon uh, lining that helps permit, uh, prevent inflammation and helps prevent colon cancer. And uh, you know, those are real concerns today. A lot of people have colon problems. So just by feeding that gut bacteria, it gives this, uh, produces this substance that's very healthy for us. And also, we talked one night about making smoothies to get more nutrients, but there's a lot of benefits of just chewing your food because we chew imperfectly. No matter how well you chew, you're not going to chew as well as the blender does. Part of that passes on down into the colon, and then those bacteria work on that. So actually, it helps those bacteria when you don't blend, when you leave a little bit of something for them to eat on. And so they, uh, they did this study and they took a, a group of people, they split into two parts, and they had them eat the same food for breakfast and lunch. Now, for breakfast, uh, for example, they might have had oats, uh, it's like a whole oat in the form of mucilage. I think I've got a picture here, so like the something on the top left. And then they took that same food and blended it and gave it to the second group. For lunch, they might have had something like beans in the whole form on the left, and then they made it into something like hummus that you see in the right picture at the bottom. And so uh, you have a, a more of a whole form here in a, in a more broken down form. And what happened was that the whole, now all of this was whole foods. They're just, one is blended more than the other. And it showed that the whole food that was not broken down with a blender actually doubled their stool size more than the ground grain diet did or the ground diet. And they gave the bacteria so much more to eat that the bacteria multiplied more. And so uh, even though people were supposed to chew their food well, when they inspected the stool that came out, they found sometimes intact uh, like whole pieces of seeds or grains. And so, but then they looked at it under the microscope and what they found was that they weren't really intact at all, but the bacteria had been chowing down on these little things that passed through and that fed the bacteria. So I'm not encouraging you not to chew your food. Chew as well as you can, but some of that is still going to go down and feed those bacteria in our colon. And so some smoothies are fine, but you don't want to blend all your food. You want, to, you want to chew, chew, chew also, okay? And if you eat the right foods, you'll get those good bacteria. There are bad bacteria that can multiply. Now, I'll just tell you right off the bat, the good bacteria are promoted by what kind of foods do you think? The plant-based foods, okay? 
the bad bacteria that will produce substances that can actually lead to more colon cancer and inflammation are, are, uh, will proliferate with an animal food-based diet. And this can change very quickly. Let's say you've been eating uh, you know, a meat-based diet. Just within a few days, if you go on a whole food, plant-based diet, that whole bacteria population can change very quickly just within a few days or back the other way. Uh, whatever you feed is what grows. And so you want to feed the right things and you'll get the right bacteria. Now, we'll go to the insoluble fiber first and just take a little quick look at this. And the insoluble fiber uh, has a very important function in the body. It captures water like a sponge. And so it makes the stool spongy. It holds water. If you don't have this insoluble fiber in your food that goes on down, then the water will just leave that and the stool will become dry and you will become constipated, right? Okay, so it's very important. This is very important that you drink enough water and have the insoluble fiber. And uh, uh, the residues, the fecal material moves down through the colon by a process called peristalsis. And so the colon squeezes on that. And if it's nice and spongy and fluffy and big, then it squeezes it on down easily. And you could think of it kind of like squeezing a tube of toothpaste that just comes right on, on out like it should. But without that fiber in there, you're going to get some rocks, OK? It dries up. Now, with this uh, cycle, what happens is people get constipated. And we've counseled with people all over the world. And I find constipation is a major problem everywhere, no matter where you are. And uh, so people often take a laxative. And so that relieves the constipation. But they didn't remove the cause of the constipation. They still don't have enough fiber in their diet. They are probably not drinking enough water because even if you got the fiber, if you don't drink enough water, it's going to get dry. And they don't move enough. We're becoming a very sedentary uh, world. And so you've got to move also. And then if you don't change that, if you don't add the fiber and the water and the movement, then the constipation will come back. And what do they do again? They take another laxative. And this is just a cycle people go through. So natural laxatives are movement. You want that exercise, plenty of water, lots of uh, whole plant foods. Everything you eat should be a whole plant food, actually. You don't need refined products. Whole plant foods, whole grains have a lot of this, insolu uh, this so insoluble fiber. And the regular meal times also ha uh, helps this, too. We're in a society today where we just kind of graze a little here and there. But we need regular meal times, and that will also help you stay regular. Now, if you're constipated a lot, you can develop something called diverticular disease. And a lot of people have this because the, as the colon wall tries to press in with this peristalsis to move the fecal mass downward, it, um, it, it can't press. And it pushes out these little pouches on the side of the colon called diverticuli. And, are, and then you develop diverticular disease as you get these little diverticuli. And here you can see, here's one pouching out here in these drawings. Here's a real picture, and those are quite large here coming off on the side. And this is a very common intestinal disorder, which can be prevented by preventing constipation with a whole foods diet and lots of water. And um, they have done studies, lots of studies on diverticulosis. And they found that in societies where people eat a whole food plant-based diet, that they really don't get this disease. And so they did a study among Africans and in Africa and African Americans. And they found that more than 50% of African Americans in their you know, age 50s uh, age group were found to have diverticulosis. But then they went to Africa and they looked at autopsies that were done in Uganda. And there was only, in this particular study, only two out of 4,000 Africans that were found to have diverticulosis. And then they looked at Johannesburg, South Africa, and there were no cases of diverticulosis found in 2,000 autopsies. 
Uh, and so this is the same genetic population. We can see it's not a genetic problem, but it's a, it's a lifestyle problem. When people come to the United States, they get on the American lifestyle, the American diet, and then they start to get these problems. This is across the board with many different diseases this happens. And varicose veins also. Now, uh, your veins are designed uh, with, small, with thin walls because there's no pressure like there is in the arteries. And they have these little valves that keep blood from going backwards. And so if you're constipated, this goes back to constipation again. If you're constipated and you strain when you're having a bowel movement, uh, it cuts off the blood flow uh, going upward. So the blood's coming from the legs, and then your abdominal area, you tense up, and it presses in on these veins and cuts off the blood flow. And so it may not last long, but over time, see that blood can't go anywhere, and you have more blood coming in, so it starts to stretch those veins out. And then eventually it can get bad enough that you, know, you get this back where the blood can go backwards and they get worse and worse. Hemorrhoids is a similar problem in the rectum and anus. And uh, you can get uh, hemorrhoids inside or outside. They're quite uncomfortable for people. This is from straining. Uh, maybe other causes too with the varicose veins in the legs. There seems to be a pretty strong genetic pro um, inheritance there also with the, with the varicose veins in the legs. Okay, and then hiatus hernia. Uh, it's, a, it's a similar problem. When you strain, it puts pressure. And so this can actually, if you have a little bit of a, a loose opening in your diaphragm, it can push part of the stomach back up into the chest cavity. And that's a hiatus or hiatal hernia. Appendicitis uh, also can be caused by constipation because fecal material moves in and out of the appendix with peristalsis, just like it does through the rest of the system. And you get some hard fecal material that blocks that so it can't get out. It sits there. There's a lot of bacteria in there and it starts to get uh, inflamed. And of course, if your appendix ruptures, all this bacteria can go into your abdominal cavity and you can die very quickly. Uh, you wanna get to the doctor if, you know, if that happens. Okay, now let's look at soluble fiber. This is found in most fruits and vegetables and um, legumes, whole grains, nuts and seeds. Actually, there's probably a mix of soluble and insoluble fiber in most all foods, but they'll be predominantly one or the other. And with the soluble fiber, it becomes jelly-like. If you've ever bought jelly at the store, pectin is a soluble fiber. It will have pectin in it. And that's what makes it gel. And you can make jelly yourself with, with uh, fruit juice or something by adding pectin. And it also uh, slows the rate at which food leaves your stomach. So that helps you have that full feeling for a longer period of time slows the absorption of sugar into the bloodstream that's released from your food, and it helps stabilize the blood sugar curve. So that means instead of getting these sharp spikes of your sugar and your bloodstream going up and then maybe going too low, it's more of an even release into the bloodstream, and that, uh, that keeps you from getting hypoglycemic, and it just helps you uh, be able to make it till the next meal time. And then also, soluble fiber binds bile acids in the small intestine. Bile is made in the liver, is stored in the gallbladder, and then it's shot into the small intestine to break down fats that you eat. And so this bile has a lot of cholesterol in it. And so the bile will be reabsorbed if you don't have good soluble fiber in your diet, but if you have that fiber, it will combine with, the, with these bile acids and help carry them out of the body. You want to get rid of that. You don't want to reabsorb the bile. It causes problems when you do that. Your cholesterol levels will go up if you're reabsorbing your bile. So this helps lower cholesterol levels. Now, if you have lower cholesterol levels, that helps prevent heart disease, right? So actually, fiber can help prevent heart disease by lowering that, those cholesterol levels. And uh, so you can see here, this is uh, a clean artery, some cholesterol buildup in this artery, and then a lot of cholesterol buildup. You're getting ready for a heart attack at this point. And so just by eating some fiber, you can help prevent this. 
And, uh, you know, I just wanted to mention that they've done studies with these fiber supplements and as opposed to a whole food plant-based diet. And the supplements really don't work to prevent all of these things like the whole uh, food plant-based diet does. Um, they're not sure that it's all just fiber that does this because there's a lot of things connected with fiber. Remember, we have that orchestra of nutrients. And so all of these work together to bring about these good results. It may not be just the fiber. So taking a supplement, well, that can move your bowels, but it's not the best solution to the problem. You need whole plant foods like God created them. And then gallbladder disease, if your cholesterol levels are high, your body will put a lot of that, trying to get rid of it, into your bowel. And then that sits in the gallbladder and it comes out and forms stones. And they've shown, shown about 80 to 90 percent of gallstone cases, the gallstones are made out of cholesterol from high cholesterol levels. And so you can help save your gallbladder and prevent gallbladder disease by eating whole plant foods and keeping that cholesterol level lower. <clears throat> How about breast cancer? Well, they have now, they're finding these reabsorbed bile acids collected in tumors in the breast. And so now they're making the association between breast cancer and uh, low fiber and reabsorbed bile acids. So it helps prevent breast cancer also by eating these high fiber foods. Fiber can also bind up uh, toxic elements like lead and mercury, which we may not on purpose eat, of course, but they are in some of the foods that we eat. Our environment is very polluted, and so we'll take these things in, but fiber can help bind that and get rid of it. And uh, by the way, it just uh, did mention that even without the fiber, that plant foods independent of fiber can help bind these bile acids also. Okay, with colon cancer, uh, you've got these bacteria that feed on the, uh, the good fiber, and that reduces your risk of colon cancer, and also the high fiber moves that stool out, and so it reduces contact time. So if you have some carcinogens in your diet, that gets rid of it faster if you have the high fiber diet instead of it just sitting there as it would if you were constipated. So that also lowers your colon cancer risk. And obesity. They did a study in a double-blinded randomized trial of overweight and obese men and women. Almost 90% of the real oatmeal tested subjects had reduced body weight. They took some subjects and gave them real oatmeal and some subjects thought they were getting oatmeal, but they didn't. I don't know what they got. I can't remember. But the ones that got the real oatmeal actually lost weight uh, and compared to this control group. And they uh, got a, lost a little weight on their waist. Their cholesterol dropped, and they had an improvement in liver function also. And uh, one of the things that helps with the weight, with the soluble fiber, is it forms that gel. Remember when you combine it with water, it forms a gel? It forms that in the stomach. It makes it feel full and delays that stomach emptying. So that's one of the benefits of it. And then non-alcohol fatty liver disease. This is the uh, main cause of liver disease today is from overeating. It's from being overweight and obesity. It's very damaging to the liver. It can even lead to cirrhosis of the liver, which has uh, you know, been an alcohol-caused disease. But obesity now, they found, can cause cirrhosis. And um, <clears throat> they uh, found out that whole grains, as opposed to refined, refined grains, actually decrease your risk of that. The whole grains have a protective effect on the liver to help protect against the non-alcohol fatty liver disease. And I just wanted to look quickly at a rice kernel here. This would be pretty much the same for wheat or other grains. But what you're looking at, this is a husk out here or a hull that has to be taken off. And then inside, this little grain pops out, and you have a covering here that's the bran. That's where your fiber is on that outer part, right out here. It's a little thin layer. Your bran is there, and your fiber, and most of your phytochemicals are out there. And then you have the germ that has uh, some uh, vitamins and 
uh, oils and, and minerals and so forth. And what they do is when they make white rice or white, you know, polished wheat to make white bread, they polish off this outer layer of bran and they take off this germ. So all you got left is this inside, which is mainly starch and some protein. All your nutrients are gone, your fiber's gone. So if you really want uh, to get all the benefit from your grains, you've got to have whole grains. You need, you need, um, you know, 100% whole grain bread. And this is just showing a picture here, you know, whole wheat bread as opposed to white, brown rice as opposed to white rice. That's what you're looking for. That's what you want. Okay, so we get exceptional fiber in beans. Those are the best. They have more than twice as much fiber as any other food. And berries, all kinds of berries. These are very high in antioxidants also. And then excellent fiber in the root crops and in whole grains. Very good fiber in all the fruits and vegetables. Poor fiber if you peel your, uh, uh, like apples or whatever, a lot of the fiber, most of the fiber in apples is actually in the peeling, so you want to keep that peeling if you can. And poor fiber when you juice. Even if you juice at home, you'll get a little bit, but it's not going to be very much. None in the animal products and oils and sugars and dairy products, that kind of thing. So if you want fiber, you've got to eat whole food, plant-based. And unfortunately, most of the world is moving toward the Western diet. And uh, I like this picture because it really portrays that we've been in a lot of different countries and the diet is changing. And so people that used to eat their traditional plant foods are now going to McDonald's and buying colas and all this. You can see that everywhere. And their health is starting to show that also. And so I'm just going to end with this Bible verse, Isaiah 55, 2. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfies not? And this has uh, in the Bible, you know, a spiritual application that we're looking in many places for something that satisfies us, but we can't find it there. It's very applicable today with our food also, that we're spending on food that is non-food, that doesn't nourish our body. We need good, healthy food physically and spiritually, right?